Welcome back. Syntax parsers input a plain text sentence and output the sentence annotated with syntactic structure. Parsing is difficult due to the ambiguity of natural language. The first ambiguity that a parser will have to deal with is part of speech ambiguity. Many parsers perform part of speech tagging as an initial step. If the part of speech tagging is wrong, the errors will affect the accuracy of the parse. Consider this sentence, the luxurious feel of the coat made her feel beautiful. The first feel in the sentence is correctly identified as a noun, but the second should have been identified as a verb. The second instance of feel was misclassified by the NLTK part of speech tagger. Parsers must also deal with structural ambiguity which is ambiguity in assigning a syntax structure to a sentence. Structural ambiguity means that more than one parse could be assigned to the sentence. An example of this is illustrated in this old Marx Brothers joke. I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I'll never know. The ambiguity in this sentence is attachment ambiguity. Where do we attach the prepositional phrase, in my pajamas? In the parse on the left, the prepositional phrase attaches to the elephant, whereas on the right, it attaches to the verb. This attachment ambiguity occurs whenever a phrase can be moved to more than one place in the syntax tree. Here's another example of attachment ambiguity. I'm displaying it in the syntax tree generator that we've looked at before. We saw the man with the binoculars. With this syntax, we see the prepositional phrase here. If I get rid of this closing brace, we see that now the prepositional phrase is within the verb phrase. Another type of structural ambiguity is coordination ambiguity, which occurs with coordinating conjunctions such as and and or. Consider the phrase old men and dogs. Does this mean old men and old dogs? are old men and dogs of any age. As humans, we would make a decision based on context, but this could prove troublesome to parsers. These ambiguities in language limit the accuracy of our parsers. In the rest of this video, we'll look at three different types of parsers. Phrase structure grammar parse, PSG, dependency parse, and semantic role label parse. The PSG parse is somewhat similar to the formal CFG discussed in the previous chapter in that it organizes sentence constituents into a hierarchy of phrases. Modern PSG parsers are trained on millions of annotated sentences in order to model the structure of natural language, which is of course much more complex and varied than the formal language of the CFG. Here we see the bracket notation in the rendered tree showing the hierarchy. Our sentence is composed of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. The noun phrase is a determiner followed by a noun. The verb phrase is a verb followed by a noun phrase followed by a prepositional phrase in the living room. I want to show you another way of visualizing the syntax using allennlp.org. This is from the Natural Language Processing Group at the Allen Institute for AI. From their main page, if you go to View Demo, and then go to Constituency Parsing, which is their term for the PSG parse, then type in your sentence and hit Run. And we see our sentence is composed of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. We can expand the noun phrase into the butler. We can expand the verb phrase into the verb, the noun phrase of John, and the prepositional phrase in the living room. If we expand John, we just see that it's a proper noun. If we expand the prepositional phrase, we see that it's a preposition followed by a noun phrase, and we could expand the noun phrase even more into the living room. So although this doesn't display a tree, 
Uh, it's a very nice representation showing the hierarchy. And just like the tree, the bottom layer is the tokens labeled by part of speech. Now I've added a subordinate clause here because he was angry about his wages. And we see that that's an S bar. S is the token for a complete sentence. S bar means it's a subordinate clause. When we expand that, we see that it's the because, the pre preposition. And then we have an S here, a complete sentence. The first clause in the sentence, the butler murdered John in the living room, that's an independent clause. It can stand on its own. And the second clause is called a subordinate clause because it can't stand on its own because of this word because. The subordinate clause provided additional information about the motivation of the butler. That's what we infer from our human reading of this sentence. However, notice in the constituency parsing or the PSG parse, there's nothing in here that tells us this. It is only concerned with the structure of the syntax. Now I'm going to request the dependency parse. A dependency parse shows relationships between words of a sentence in an acyclic graph. Here I've typed in a simpler sentence, the butler murdered his boss, and we see that the root of this sentence is the verb murdered, and the root has two direct dependents. One is the subject, the butler, and the other is the direct object, his boss. And again, you can expand any of these. Another good tool for dependency parsing is Stanford's Core NLP, which I'll discuss in another video. They have a visualization tool at corenlp.run. Here I've typed in our longer sentence, asked for parts of speech, uh, named entities, and dependency parse. So here we see simply the parts of speech, named entities, and here's our acyclic graph. And we see that everything comes from murdered. Murdered, again, has two children. One is the butler, and the other is the direct object, John. Let's look at the subordinate clause here, because he was angry about his wages. Angry is the predicate, and its copular linking verb is was. And the subject is he. He was angry. It may seem strange that the predicate here in this subordinate clause is not the verb. And that seems strange because we normally think of predicate and verb as meaning the same thing. Let's examine the copular construction in a simpler sentence, John is handsome. Here we see that the predicate is the adjective handsome. It has two dependents, the copular is and the subject John. So we see the linking between John and his description here using this copular construction. Why do linguists tell us that the predicate is handsome and not is? Let's think about the evidence that is should be the predicate. For one thing, this is could change tense, and it could match the subject. Let's say John and William are handsome, or were handsome. So that's some evidence that the copular linking verb should be the predicate. But let's look at some evidence that handsome should be the predicate. Now we've put this in a subordinate clause. Mary thinks that John is handsome. We see the same construction between John is handsome here. In this construction, Mary thinks John handsome. Notice that the is became unnecessary. This is the strongest evidence that the copular verb be is not really the predicate. When we said that John is handsome, what we were describing John as was an adjective. Notice that it could also be a noun. John is a lawyer. And here we see again the same construction. The predicate is the noun lawyer, and is is connecting in the copular construction John and lawyer. This figure in the book lists the Stanford dependencies. There's also a set of universal dependencies, which is a little different. In the book, I have a link to the basic dependencies that we see here, a PDF about these, which is worth reading because it explains many important concepts. 
Notice that there's a structure here. The top level is root. DEP is used whenever a more specific relation cannot be found. The root is going to be the verb or the predicate for copular constructions. The main dependencies of the root are these arguments of subjects, agents, and different kinds of objects in complements. Here we have many different types of modifiers. These modifiers provide additional information in the sentence, but they're not central players in the sentence. Examples of modifiers are prepositional phrases, adjective, adverbial clause modifiers, and so forth. This distinction between arguments and modifiers becomes more explicit in the next parse that we discuss, the semantic role label parse. One of the advantages of the dependency parse is that it explicitly labels the subject of the sentence. The dependency parse also labels other major arguments of the verb, such as objects and complements. Objects are familiar to most people from school grammar, direct and indirect objects. Complements are less familiar. Complements complete what the predicate is expressing. There are three types of complements in the standard dependencies. A comp, C comp, and X comp. Here's a table from the book which describes these common sentence patterns that we see with the subject in a verb and any objects and complements, as well as with examples and a little commentary. We can have just a subject verb, like the cowboys lost, and we don't have to have an object or complement for some verbs. Some verbs will require an object. We can have subject verb direct object, like the cowboys lost the game, and we can have an indirect object as well as a direct object. The cowboys handed them the game. Let's look at these complements, which are less familiar. One is an adjective complement, which the dependencies label as A comp. He look tired. So we need tired to complete the meaning here of looked. The C comp is a dependent clause with an internal subject. Let's look at the sentence, I hope that you get the job. We have an internal subject here in this subordinate clause. X comp comes in two flavors. It's basically a dependent clause with no internal subject, so that's the distinction between the X comp and the C comp. Often we see this in the infinitive form. I love to take long walks, so there's no internal subject here. And sometimes we see it with the gerund. I love walking in the woods. Again, no internal subject. Different verbs accept different numbers and kinds of objects or complements. Notice that lost is pretty flexible. It doesn't have to have an object or complement, but it can. I like using dependency parses in my projects because it gets a little bit deeper into a little bit of semantics with these distinctions of the role that different clauses and phrases play in a sentence. Another parse I like to use is the SRL semantic role labeling parse, sometimes called shallow semantic parsing. The SRL parse determines the role of sentence constituents relative to the predicate. SRL identifies who did what to whom, when, where, how, and why. There are two categories of labels relative to the predicate, arguments and modifiers. Arguments indicate the actors in the sentence, or the persons or objects acted upon. Modifiers give more detail, such as time and place of the action. Consider this sentence that we've looked at before. We see that everything again starts with the verb, and we have two arguments the butler, and John. Arguments are numbered, 0 and 1. There are about six levels of arguments, and they vary depending on the verb. What we call the verb frame are the slots in which arguments can fit. In general, we can say that argument 0 is the actor of the sentence, and argument 1 is the person or object acted upon. 
We'll talk more about that in a minute. Argument two is sometimes the instrument of the action. In this sentence, our verb has two arguments and one modifier. This subordinate clause, because he was angry about his wages, is a modifier to the verb, and it gives cause. Notice when I click it, it highlights that clause there. So you see why this is sometimes called a shallow semantic parser, because we're getting a little bit into the semantics. Let's talk a little bit more about argument zero versus argument one. Here, argument zero is the actor in the sentence. It also happens to be the subject. John is the entity acted upon, and it's the direct object in this sentence. What happens if we flip this around into a passive construction? We see that John is still argument one, even though now it's the subject of the sentence. And argument zero still refers to the butler. So whereas the dependency parse explicitly identifies the subject, the semantic role label parse is not concerned with that. It's concerned with who did what to whom. I've added a few more phrases to the sentence so we can get a look at other types of modifiers. We still have John and the butler as argument zero and argument one, but now we have a lot of modifiers. Location, manner, temporal, and cause. In a future video, I'll describe how to do parsing with commonly used parsers such as Spacey, Core NLP from Stanford, and Senna. This material will be in a later chapter of the book. For now, I'll leave you with a quote by Steve Marabali. The way you live each day is a sentence in the story of your life. Every day you make the choice whether the sentence ends with a period, a question mark, or exclamation point. Mm -hmm.